So, <clears throat> so that meditation was a little bit inspired by my Zen teacher, Mel Weitzman. And uh, he's 91 years old. And after 53 years as the teacher, the abbot of the Berkeley Zen Center, yesterday he stepped down from his role. And uh, <clears throat> so I was, because of this, it's usually a public ceremony, it was a public ceremony, uh, but on, on Zoom and YouTube. <clears throat> so I attended that way. And it was quite uh, touching for me to be at my old teacher's uh, stepping down, kind of retirement from his role as <clears throat> that he had for so many years. And um, <clears throat> so that's really what's in my heart, my mind. And so what I thought I would do this morning is talk a little bit about him. And for some of you, perhaps that's, this is interesting because, um, you know, he was my Zen teacher, formative teacher for me, and uh, very important, and remains very important for me, and remains a reference point for me in the Dharma. And maybe it's not always so visible, but even by people who know him, um, but, um, you know, part of what I teach, when I teach, uh, comes out of his teaching, and maybe more than his teaching, how he lived in the world. And, um, and, um, and so when I teach the Dharma, my Dharma talks, my Dharma expression, live the Dharma, um, it's kind of a, a little bit of a hybrid of my experience at, in Zen practice and with this teacher, Mel Weitzman, and also my Theravadan practice, my Vipassana practice, and the teachers I met uh, in that tradition as well. So hopefully this is interesting for you to hear a little bit about him and maybe some of you will find it, as I said, interesting because of how it might reflect on me if you've been listening to me for some time. So um, Mel Weitzman was, a, was born in 1929 and uh, as a young adult he was an artist, kind of a, my impression is a little bit of a starving artist. Uh, living in the Bay Area, and he um, was a taxi driver, and that's how he supported himself. And then in 1964, he met uh, Shinryo Suzuki, uh, Suzuki Roshi, and started practicing with the founder of the San Francisco Zen Center, the Japanese priest. And um, three years later, in 1967, uh, Suzuki Roshi asked him to start or support a uh, beginning of a small Zen center, uh, starting with just a sitting group, in uh, Berkeley, California, across the bay. I think also that Mel that maybe lived in Berkeley by then. I, and so uh, they say they founded the Berkeley Zen Center together, and it was a small uh, zendo in an attic, uh, in a two-story Berkeley uh, home. And um, high up in the attic was... Uh, they converted to a zendo. And, uh, when I first started sitting uh, Zen, relatively early, I would sit there sometimes and for day-long retreats. And I remember, um, you know, the the A-frame roof. Uh, we were underneath the rafters of the roof, and and a um, little bit dark, and but kind of cozy up there in the attic. And um, uh, Suzuki Roshi ordained him as a Zen priest in that attic. And there's a photograph of that ceremony. It's kind of cozy. It's not like in a big temple, but in this attic with you know these angled, sloped rafters above above them as they were doing the ceremony. And um, so it kind of speaks to a kind of different kind of Zen, not the formal, maybe um, monastic Zen of uh, temple life in Japan, but something that in 1967 in Berkeley is going to express a very different kind of ethos than. And um, and there was a beautiful story that uh, I read yesterday. That so they were sitting there in the attic meditating, a small group of people, and sometimes there were only uh, one or two people would come and meditate with him, and uh, but sometimes there were more, and they would meditate early in the morning, and one day a police officer knocked on the door, 
And so Mel went to the door to answer, and the police officer said that uh, he was just checking on the house because it was early in the morning and all these lights were on. It was everything okay? And um, Mel said yes, and and we said, well, you know, I, some time ago, before you had this house, uh, I was involved in uh, coming into this house and searching the walls for drugs. And uh, Mel said, oh, well, we're here upstairs in the attic. There's a group of us meditating. And the police officer said, um, but can't you get there much faster by getting stoned? So imagine a police officer saying that. And, um, and uh, Mel's response was, we're not going anywhere. Instead of getting somewhere fast through drugs, Mel says, we're not going anywhere. And that kind of represents his Zen, that uh, it's not about attainment, it's not about getting somewhere, but rather about um, inhabiting the, the place you're at, inhabiting the location, the situation yourself as you are now. And this idea of just inhabiting it, being in it, uh, without conceit, without seeing a problem, uh, was part of Mel's teaching. Just you there and fully there. So um, I met Mel about uh, in ni- about 1976. I was 22 years old, and I was going to college at uh, Davis, California, which is about maybe an hour, kind of northwest of Berkeley, maybe a little bit less. And um, and I was a college student there, and there was a sitting group, Zen sitting group, that met on Tuesdays and Thursday evenings in someone's little. Um, bedroom, uh, extra bedroom, and um, I would go and meditate with them every those Tuesdays and Thursdays. And every once in a while, they'd inv- invite Mel up to do a half day retreat, which would end with lunch. And uh, and that's how I met Mel. Mel would drive up from Berkeley uh, in his uh, uh, somewhat old, maybe ten year old, maybe twelve year old um, uh, Volkswagen uh, Bug, VW Bug. And which apparently he repaired himself, he'd fix himself, and um, and then uh, he would do this half day sitting, and he would do a practice discussion. We would meet one on one with him in an extra bed, another extra bedroom, in this little apartment. And um, and I remember the first time I had this formal meeting with him, I was so nervous that I couldn't speak. And um, the first thing that Mel told me in this kind of as a teacher was uh, breathe deeply somehow because I was so intimidated or nervous about this meeting. But what struck me about uh, this person um, uh, right away, that the first, those first encounters in Davis, was uh, something that many people have repeatedly said about him, is that how ordinary he is. That there was something extraordinary in his ordinariness. And I think that what made it extraordinary was he wasn't trying to be anything or be anything special. He wasn't trying to assert himself or uh, trying to, he wasn't trying to be a teacher. There was no sense of status that he was the teacher and other people were not. There wasn't any sense that um, uh, he had some special privileged place or role. In fact, uh, he was always ready to wash dishes. He was always ready to clean up and take care of whatever needed to be done. Um, uh, aside from whatever teaching role that he had. And this uh, simplicity and ordinariness, if you saw him in supermarket, uh, you wouldn't, um, you know, you wouldn't uh, think too much about him. It seemed like a nice man, but there was nothing that, um, you know, that uh, made him stand out as something, someone special. And um, so he was a taxi driver whatever that is. Or my wife, my wife th- usually thought of him as a, who's, my wife is Jewish, would think of him as a ni- nice Jewish uh, um, deli owner. He would go down, down the street to get deli sandwiches from him. And um, 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 the, uh, and then I, I had, uh, so I went to live at San Francisco Zen Center and eventually went to the monastery of Tassajara, and I had some contact with him, not a lot. Um, but I remember once uh, walking, uh, running into him at Tassajara, this monastery, I'd been living there for a couple of years, and we kind of crossed paths, and, and um, I just, without any premeditation, 
as we passed each other, I told him that I had become a response machine. And this idea of being a response machine in retrospect was probably a pretty, you know, not a very inspiring statement to make. But uh, just in the moment, that's kind of what came out of my mouth. But what I was trying to say was that what I had become very happily in a sense of a sense of freedom, what I'd become was um, that I now lived uh, in this world responding to things as they came along. And that sense of response, using the word machine, was that um, it was, uh, was somehow natural, automatic, a little bit spontaneous, that there was this kind of way of just being responsive that felt like it welled up from someplace deep inside that was very different than how I had known how to live before that. Or before that, it was about the ego, about me, myself, and mine, about the, my fear, which was a big part of my life early in, li- early in adulthood. Um, but it was just, um, there was some deeper sense of uh, welling up of connection. And if the, something needed to be cleaned, if the, if the path needed to be swept, then the movement to sweep came up from out inside of me. And uh, this was such a special feeling for me, and I was discovering living in the monastery and meditating a lot, that I just shared it there with him, and uh, he smiled. The, um, the next big uh, encounter I had with Mel that made an impression on me was in 1983. Uh, that's when the abbot of San Francisco Zen Center at that time uh, was not Mel, it was someone else. And uh, that person had uh, a scandal. Uh, he had been sleeping with some students. He had been maybe maybe uh, misappropriating, misusing his authority, his power over the students. And so um, it all came to a head. And uh, it was, you know, you can imagine it was, became, it was a, you know, it was a big place, San Francisco Zen Center, and many people had devoted their lives there. So it came as a big shock to the community and it was very devastating for many people. And when I heard about this, uh, when this scandal broke, uh, the first thing I did was I went over to Berkeley to talk to Mel. Um, Mel had been part of San Francisco Zen Center almost from the beginning, and I thought he would have some wisdom, and just I would talk to him and check in with him about it. And um, I wasn't particularly alarmed or disturbed by all that. It wasn't like personally sh- shattered by the habit scandal, but I was concerned enough I wanted to go talk to Mel. And and, uh, and what I remember of that conversation was um, uh, very important for me. Uh, what he sa- one of the things he said was he, he was on the board at that time of the San Francisco Zen Center. And before Suzuki Roshi died and he made the successor, the next person, the abbot, uh, the terms of office for board members was for life. And so he was a life member of the board, and he could see that something was wrong with how the abbot uh, was conducting himself. He didn't know about the sexual scandals, but uh, the way he was using authority and, and, um, and the way he was holding himself. And, and there was something not quite right. And, um, and Mel uh, couldn't really say anything. Uh, if he did, it didn't really go anywhere because most people were supporting the new abbot. And for 12 years, he just thought, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just stay here. This will have to come to a head at some point. And, um, and I'll just patiently wait until it comes to a head, and then I'll support and help uh, what has to happen next. And this idea of having a long-term view like that, of realizing that there's nothing I can do, but I will stay here and hang in there until uh, something changes, and then I'm here to support it and help it. And, um, and that it did. So when uh, that abbot eventually resigned, and Mel was there in the edges, kind of supporting people, supporting Zen Center, um, until uh, 1988, 87, 88, he started teaching more and more at San Francisco Zen Center. In 88, he become, became um, the co-abbot of Zen Center. And, um, and by that time, I was living at Green Gulch Zen Center. I was then the manager of the meditation hall. So I had a lot of contact with him as the abbot there. And, um, and it was lovely to have this contact with him and be in communication with him. And, and uh, one of the big lessons I received from him then 
which uh, maybe doesn't sound so big, but the implications were, you know, huge, uh, if you understand it. Uh, in Zen, you eat in the meditation hall in a very formal way. Uh, you, in a choreographed way, you sit in meditation posture, there's a, a, a wooden kind of plank in front of you where you have three bowls, or if you're a priest, you have more bowls, you have like five bowls. And, um, and servers come and serve your food, food in the meditation hall, put food in the three bowls, and, um, and you bow a lot, and then before you eat, you chant, when you finish, you chant, and, um, so it's a, and, it, and you eat in silence, with a room full of people in this formal way with three bowls. So I, I got into the idea to eat uh, without any desire, just to eat, to eat, to eat efficiently, so I just uh, decided that the, the most efficient, desireless way to eat was to pick up the first bowl, with them had the most food, like the rice in it, and just eat it all. Finish, put it down. Take the second bowl, eat it all, finish, put it down. Eat the third bowl, finish, and, uh, and put it down. And just I was just kind of just going through like that. And, but the abbot, Mel, sat next to me in the meditation hall. He saw what I was doing. And some point he said to me, Gil, uh, when you eat, uh, just eat naturally. That's all he said. And, uh, and I realized that the way I was eating was kind of unnatural, just eat all one, all second on, you know, dish and the third dish. And so then I just kind of sat down to eat and uh, I saw that kind of independent of desires, there seemed to be an intuitive feeling for take a few bites of this, a few bites of this, a few bites of this, and kind of go back and forth, um, and maybe mix it up in the belly or in the mouth or something. And this kind of this this kind of more intuitive way of eating, of just kind of doing what's more natural and what the system inside, maybe the tongue, the belly, who knows what's operating that that pulls us towards different food that way. Uh, actually, had a lot more ease than the kind of ease I had of just being efficient and eating all of one another. And this idea of, of uh, just doing things in a more natural way and not making it a big thing and, and uh, not being driven by desire but not avoiding some deeper intuitive desire or, or intuition about how to do things and what to do. Um, and um, it was nice being when, he, you know, when I was living at Green Gulch, and he was abbot kind of his first year or so that he was abbot of Zen Center, that he, um, it was quite something, he would come and I would often work in the garden, and the, there was a farm there, I'd work in the farm, and he would often come and work with us in the farm. We'd, I remember I memories of him coming into the greenhouse, and we were preparing seedlings for, lettuce seedlings to plant in the, in the fields. And, uh, and he would always kind of work with people. The idea that he would work, he, he would work with people and not always be off being the abbot or be off being the teacher, separate in status, but he'd be in the fields working with us or in the kitchen washing dishes with us. And the idea of with, working with people, was part of what he taught, what, how he was. Um, and, um, and the idea that, uh, and he said that during that time he was abbot of San Francisco Zen Center and the abbot of the Berkeley Zen Center. And Zen Center had three temples. And he would do the circuit to take care of all these people, all these temples, you know, and it was quite a you know, big job. But what he said was that, uh, you know, back then, the you know, they had, Zen Center had an explosion with the abbot scandal, trying to figure out, many people left, trying to figure out what to do next financially and all kinds of things. And he was there, he was being the supportive abbot. And he said that during that time, um, he never related to Zen Center as if there was ever ever a problem. There was no problems. There was just something to address uh, when it needed to be addressed. And uh, so he'd wake up in the morning and and uh, he, he would not see a problem. And he would get up and then someone would come to him with something to be addressed and he would address it and, and uh, take care of what needed to be taken care of, whether it was washing dishes or talking about fundraising or talking about institutional issues of the Zen Center as a whole, all these people who lived there, there were probably, I don't know, 150 people who lived at Zen Center at that time. And uh, this way of conducting himself where he didn't live as if there was a problem, 
but he lived as if there was really something to fully be present for and meet, to really meet the situation and be present and, and find your way and do what needed to be done, but without seeing as a problem and without any sense of hurry, without any sense of, of uh, crisis, without any sense of uh, hesitation as well. Just, just there he was. And um, as if it was the most ordinary thing in the world to do and take care of. Um, a few years later, uh, we, we, he and I were walking down the streets of San Francisco, just going for a walk, talking about things. And, um, and he asked me this uh, question, which kind of came out of the blue. And, but he asked me, um, uh, um, uh, how do you feel about me? Or how do you see me? What's your relationship to me? And I said, told, told him um, that I trusted him implicitly. I had complete trust in him as a person. However, I didn't always uh, feel aligned with his dharma, with how he taught. And, um, and so it's a little bit strange, especially a, a Zen teacher who's my teacher, you know, to say, that, say you know, you, I think you're, you're, I trust you, but not necessarily what you, how, what you have to teach, your Buddhism that you teach. And, um, and his response was so powerful. So we were walking down the road, you know, side by side, and I said this statement. And when I said, I, I don't always, you know, trust or feel aligned with your Dharma, your teaching, he immediately pivoted in front of me, stood in front of me, and brought his hands together like this, and said, well, and that's where we'll meet. Rather than being upset that, you know, that maybe it was disrespectful to say I didn't really trust his Dharma or how he, what he was teaching, um, he was almost like delighted by this. And for him, this was a meeting place. See, you meet whatever is there. You don't make it a problem but you meet it. And then a l- little l- l- later, he asked me if I wanted to start training with him to be- receive Dharma transmission, to become a Zen teacher. And um, I felt, you know, I, I felt a little bit, I don't know, maybe shy, or I, I forget exactly how I was feeling about it. And I said, well, let's not talk about that. But let me start coming over to see you regularly, and I'll study with you. And then for the next three or four years, I'd go over to Berkeley most weeks and meet with him in his office. And uh, we would study Buddhist texts together. We would discuss the Dharma together. And, and there was a lot of personal time together. Sometimes he'd make me lunch. And, um, and, we would, um, and I would ask him a lot of questions about himself, about how he lived his life. and because um, I, I felt it was how he lived and who he was was really important for me to try to understand better. And that was his teaching, was not so much the text that we were studying, but who he was and how he was. And I was probably a little bit forward and at probing, asking, fine, who is this guy? Who is this? Who are you? And asking all kinds of questions. And, and he always very, like he would meet anything, like he would, next thing to do is to wash the dishes, next thing to do is to answer Gil's questions. And um, and then uh, it seemed like after a few years, it was kind of evolving without anything being said in the direction that I would um, become, do this Dharma transmission, that I would uh, do this, um, become a formal Zen teacher. And, um, but then this uh, speed bump happened, and that is that um, I had another Zen teacher as well at Zen Center kind of before that, um, who I felt somewhat close to. And that teacher came to me and said, well, what about me? <laughs> what about doing Dharma transmission with me? So I said, I don't know. And so I went back to Mel and told him about this other teacher. And uh, this was a rather unusual situation to be in. And, uh, and Mel just kind of was completely relaxed. And he said, well, we'll uh, just we'll take our time and we'll keep meeting and and you tell me what to do or what's happening. And, and uh, so the idea was I would start seeing the other Zen teacher as well and kind of figure out my relationship there. But uh, what happened was I never went to see him. And uh, after a while I realized that without any decision being made, a decision had been made. That um, it was clearly, since I wasn't going to see him, it wasn't really in the cards for me to 
continue studying with that teacher. So then I went, um, um, uh, so then Mel and I continued, and then in 1995, I received Dharma transmission from him. But the little kind of unusual thing about that was that I already in the early 1990s, 89 to 94 or so, uh, gone through teacher training as a Vipassana teacher with Jack Hornfield. So I was kind of like doing this double major of becoming a Zen teacher and a Vipassana teacher at the same time. And Mel knew that, and he was completely fine with it. And then when I went through the Dharma transmission ceremony and finished it, and I was authorized as a Zen teacher, um, uh, he explicitly came over to me and said, you know, I'm very happy to have done this Dharma transmission for you. And you should know that um, I have no expectations on you. You're free. And uh, and that was a big thing for him to say. He knew I was a, a Vipassana teacher. By that time, I was already had a, the IMC in Palo Alto teaching there. And in Zen, it's kind of a big thing because Dharma transmission is not just an authorization. There's kind of an idea that uh, the Dharma, the teachings, the the, uh, the freedom of the Dharma is being transmitted from the teacher to you, and you become the carrier of it. You become a carrier of the lineage, the Zen lineage, the particular Zen lineage that, that of Suzuki Roshi, who was Mel's teacher. And you have now a responsibility to that lineage to carry it on and pass it on to the next generation. And um, so that's kind of in the, ba- in the part of the understanding but he offered me the Dharma transmission without that being requirement. He said, here, I just want to, there's no expectation. And I know that you're a Vipassana teacher as well. And, and I'm very happy to see how your life and your teaching evolves from there. And um, so, uh, so that was quite touching for me. Uh, also that this kind of sense of um, generosity and acceptance of me as I was. And that's what a lot of people have felt about Mel, that uh, often he's been very accepting of people and uh, just there and he's there to meet you and he didn't seem to make much distinction between, uh, you know, the the in crowd and the out crowd, the them and us. He was just with whatever was happening at the time, with the people who was he was with, with the situation he was with. And it's most like this, whatever the situation he's in, that was the teaching, that was the teacher. And one of the very important teachings of Mel, uh, and I think of Soto Zen, and it's come to me, is uh, the importance of practice. That practice is really the teacher. Practice is the center. And we all share the practice. Rather than the teacher being at the center, uh, and everyone shares a teacher, Everyone, including the teacher, is sharing the practice, and we're all doing the practice together, and we're all engaged in it. And um, and the practice is not something that's limited to meditation practice or or um, the study of the Dharma. The practice is how we wash the dishes, or how we sweep the house, or how we meet people who maybe are very different from ourselves, and how we meet people who anybody that we come across that the Dharma is found, the practice is in that meeting. Uh, that's where we'll meet. And whether it's a person or a thing, the kind of the question, the Zen question is, um, what's being requested of me? In any situation, what's being requested of me? So if you have something, like I have this striker here, and, um, and uh, you don't treat their striker in Zen as just an inanimate thing that you're just there to use for some purpose and then you put it down and don't care anymore. The idea is since this is what you're meeting right now and what you're holding, you would respect it and you would look at it and say, what's the request of the situation here when I put it down? And then you would put it down in a place where it just seems to be in harmony with the situation. And um, what's the request for where this striker gets put down? And uh, in harmony here with this. And whatever we're doing, what's the request of the situation? What's the request of this person I'm with? This person wants my attention. This person has a need. And so it's kind of stepping out of our self-centeredness and our self-specialness for the sake of being in harmony with the situation. 
but not to sacrifice ourselves and not to diminish ourselves, um, but uh, in a sense, <clears throat> as an expression of our freedom of really being ourselves. And um, and uh, so one of the th- one of the things that Mel told me at some point, uh, he said, um, you know, in terms of when I started being a teacher, he said, um, it's the student that makes the teacher. And uh, that was very freeing because I'm just Gil going about my life and taking care of things in a certain way and um, I'm allowed to be myself. But when a student comes, some, some practitioner comes to ask me a question or relate to me that in the role of a teacher, then I'm a teacher. They've made me a teacher. But otherwise, you know, so in response to the situation, the request situation, I'm a teacher, but that's, you know, not really who I am. And when that's over, then I'm, the next thing I do is maybe I'm sweeping the hallway, or then I'm a sweeper. Or the next thing I'm doing is involved with um, administrative work for IMC, and then I'm an administrator. So whatever we're doing, it kind of defines what we are. But in a way that we inhabit with all of who we are, so it is who we are. It's not like we're different or, or, or um, sacrificing who we are. We meet it fully with all we are in that request of the situation. So, um, um, so this wonderful teacher, Mel Weitzman, it was very touching to see him yesterday stepping down. He has something like pancreatic cancer and uh, and so he's already quite thin, and and uh, walking into the zendo, he had to carry walk with the staff to hold himself up, and and it was quite moving to see. You know, you know, he sits up on a plat- teaching platform, and um, he was too weak to pull himself up onto the platform. Uh, two people had to kind of help him up and and sit there up, and the, and then he get once he's on, but once he was sitting there, kind of uh, ready to sit to really you know, been put up on this cushion, then he did what he's done many times before. He pulled his he pulled his feet into full lotus. And then he sat there for the next hour, an hour and a half. Um, sometimes a little bit in tears, uh, talking about his life and apologizing for any any uh, harm or hurt that he's caused in his years as an abbot. And uh, talking about his experience there and and um, and uh, so to see my old teacher being frail and we don't know how much long he has to live, but even here, stepping down from the, his dharma seat as abbot, uh, he was just there uh, inhabiting that situation, meeting that situation. And, uh, and then he stepped down and uh, went home. So uh, I hope that was uh, nice for you to hear, and uh, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to offer a little bit of uh, what's very big in my heart right today after yesterday, and a little bit of my my own kind of dharma connection and my own teacher that I had in Zen, and who remains very important for me, and. Uh, and maybe be, uh, through me, maybe he has some importance for you as well. So thank you, and um, and I look forward to next time.